One of the greatest Marti experts uh, around, uh, Dr. Rita Fountain, who uh, is uh, not only a uh, uh, great Marti scholar, she's also the institute consultant. She's the one who helped put uh, this uh, institute together. She's a professor emerita at uh, Jose, uh, San Jose State University. She's uh, published extensively on Marti. Her books include Jose Marti and U.S. Writers, Verso Sencillos, a dual language edition, Jose Marti, the United States uh, and Race, and most recently, a critical edition of Marti's translation of the Helen Hunt Jackson novel, uh, Ramona. She has authored uh, numerous articles, chapters, and reviews about Marti and Cuban topics, and done more than 70 presentations and workshops dealing with Cuba and Marti. Some of her most recent publications are Teaching the Latin American Emerson, in Approaches to Teaching the Works of Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, which was published by the uh, MLA in 2018, and also Marti and Emerson, Close Reading, Context, and Translation in the recent collection, Sinking the Americas, Jose Marti and the New Modernity, published by Bucknell. In addition, she has translated extensively from Cuban authors, including Nancy Alonso, Marilyn Boves, Senon Paz, Leonardo Padura Fuentes, and Aida Barr. So, it's a great privilege to have uh, uh, the expert Anita Fountain with us. For James Lopez, Dennis Ray, the University of Tampa and the National Endowment for the Humanities, La Primera Palabra. <laughs> <laughs> for James Lopez, Dennis Ray, the University of Tampa and the National Endowment for the Humanities, the first word. A profound thing. And for all of you distinguished scholars in this institute and the expertise you bring, the second word, a resounding thing. <coughs> I'd like to start uh, talking about Marti and Emerson. You have a book uh, that really says a lot of what I will be talking about today. But I wanted to look at two questions because how do we know that there's a connection between Emerson and Marti? First of all, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Good. So um, let's see one of the ways that, or what are some of the ways that we we can find Emerson? Anyway, the two questions. It's because it's important, not just because I also work as a translator. But one of the things that Esther and I both know is that Marti translated from uh, the U.S. press. He read newspapers, magazines. We know some of the ones he read from because he tells us. And he says his work style was to have these accounts spread out before him and to take information from them and put it into his uh, remarkable Spanish. So he took information about the author, sometimes simply commenting on what the press had said, uh, and sometimes he translated works or portions of works by the author. And we can pretty well say that the more he translated, the more he identified with an author. And certainly Emerson uh, was a major impact. The starting point is an essay. It's the one that you're reading in Selected Writings. Uh, it's an essay of May 19, 1882, sent to a Venezuelan newspaper, La Opinión Nacional. And what Martí often did is look at newspapers, typically the front page, or what was appearing in Harper's Weekly, or uh, North American Review, or Harper's Monthly, and take information. And so when they published an obituary, that was often uh, news that he used to write his chronicles. So in the essay, uh, it begins and ends with these uh, fervent declarations, and uh, he expresses his admiration for Emerson. Shortly after the essay, he follows up with another brief commentary in the same newspaper. And these are some of the principal ways we know that he's interested 
in Emerson. Now the essay described, and we can't, we don't know, sometimes we have the source that Marti looked at, we can actually say he wrote about uh, the Brooklyn Bridge and here's the art of, here's the magazine he likely took it from and we can compare. In this case, it's hard to know exactly what, what his sources were. But we think that he looked at print sources and then I, I want to uh, mention my Argentine colleague, Ariela Schneermacher, who has a new book about Marti, who highlights his use of graphic images. And for those of you who are going to be going to do research at the University of South Florida, I want to mention something they have that is perhaps unheralded. One of the, you can see here, Harper's Weekly, and I'm glad I got that cover. Harper's Weekly was a great big magazine, it's a lot of graphics, and it's not totally digitized. There's a lot from Marti's era. Newspapers and magazines, many of the journals are almost fully digitized, but this one is not. And, and actually, I think it's one where Marti got a lot of information, but a number, of the Harper's Weekly editions, these great big texts, are in the special collections at University of South Florida. So if you're interested in looking at that, I, here's the place to do it. So what does the essay describe? However, Marti got this information. He described the features of Emerson, his home, and he described, I put the picture of his home, that's also from Harper's Weekly, because in the article, the Chronicle. Marti talked about his house was, was surrounded by tall pines. Maybe the newspaper said that, maybe he saw it in the picture. He talked about the work, style, method, importance, and he has many, many quotes from uh, Emerson that he translated into Spanish. And then in the shorter article, he followed up with more titles of Emerson's works and gave attention to poetry. Now there are three fragments, and I think they're important, uh, Esther mentioned these two, uh, that we call, um, they're from, at least one of them is from 1883, and we call it La Tarde de Emerson. Now, there are several ways you can translate the, the, the word tarde, typically afternoon, and I think most people call it the afternoon of Emerson. And I, it's in the book you have, but I want to, because I think it's important, I want to just read what he says in that passage. He says, he's looking out, he's in a room, and he's looking out at the city. I have journeyed through much of life and partaken of its various pleasures, but the greatest pleasure, the only absolutely pure pleasure that I have experienced up to this point, was the one I felt that afternoon when I looked out from my room to the cross-state city and envision the future, thinking about Emerson. And I actually looked and looked to try to find a visual image of, I, this is, who knows, maybe not New York City, to try to give the idea of an 1880s city um, with a twilight or an afternoon um, that might convey some of what Marti was thinking. There's an interesting passage from Emerson, I, I won't quote it entirely, but I think it's similar. And I think I may have referred to that in the book. And it's where Emerson says, crossing snow puddles in common, I had a perfect exhilaration in communion with nature. So was Marti thinking about that quote from nature, from Emerson? Was it just a coincidence? We don't know, but that's just to be suggested. Now, Marti also translated, in addition to all the quotes we're going to see that he translated from Emerson, and which he, with which he identified, um, I think the, the four issues of La Edad de Oro, children's magazine, which we tend to think of as a book, but they were four different issues, uh, were, those issues were important because they conveyed things that he wanted to direct to the children of the Americas. And one of the poems that he translated was a, a poem by Emerson called Fable, in which Marti calls cada uno a su oficio, to each his own. And I, actually the illustration is from uh, Emerson's Fable. 
And I used it because it conveys a dialogue between a mountain and a squirrel. I think in today's poetic sensibilities, we might not be very excited about this poem as, a, as poetry, but the idea is what I think appeals to Marti. The mountain is big and it's grand. It has its purpose. The squirrel is small, and the squirrel says, okay, you have this majesty, but you can't crack a nut like I can. So they're all part of nature, and each one has a function, and one isn't better than the other. They, they, they have an equal role in nature, even if they are not the same. Now, I'm going to mention the dedicatory here in a minute. 1891. Um, the more we know about Emerson, and I want to suggest along the way that we're learning. You know, we keep adding information uh, about, about Marti, and you in this institute are going to add information about Marti. And I think that's wonderful. Uh, what we've seen, as we look closely, is that there's just lots of Emerson in Versus and Sios. And that's his most personal poetry. So some of the translations actually lead directly into the poem. But the dedicatory, I don't know if you can read it. Uh, I also recommend this to you at the University of Florida in Gainesville. They have what's called the Romero Collection. And it was actually belonged to Cesar Romero. We can debate about whether he is a descendant of Marti or not. But he had these papers, and his niece, her name is Marty, M-A-R-T-I, uh, <laughs> whom I know, and who, and Jonathan, and I met her in 2002, 2003. Um, I've been in correspondence with her, and she said, oh yes, I'm the one who sent those materials to University of Florida. Well, what's in them? I, I cannot tell you. I was happy to be in Florida. I was happy to be in Gainesville. But nothing made, nothing has given me the thrill of being able to touch something that Martine touched. So they have a lot of things digitized. But they have an edition of Verso Sensius that I have held in my hand, one that he dedicated. So where his hand was, my hand. <laughs> you have to be crazy about Marti like me to feel that exhilaration. <laughs> now, the dedicatory, and I would love all of you please tell me how you would translate this. A carmita, para que nunca dé una pena su amigo Carlo. Jose Marti. Now, this is carmita millares. Let's not get confused, right? And for those of you who know the poetry of Exocentios, there is a poem where he describes somebody who's calvo, he was losing his hair, right? That a, a woman and a calvo are walking along, right? And this is dedicated to her in this book. So I, I, we don't know for sure. I think that the couple reflected in that poem are Carmita and Marti, right? And this is his, in, entre comillas, discreet way of saying what she meant. Yeah. All right, now another thing. We just keep finding more about Emerson. Uh, 1891, I've taught Race America, our America, as many of you have for years. There's so much there. I hadn't really thought about Emerson or making a connection with Emerson. But for those of you who teach Latino studies, Latin American studies, American studies, you're going to do comparisons. I know when I talk to high school teachers and they teach Nuestra America, they often say, well, I, I compare it to Dario's poem, Ruben Dario's poem, A, A Roosevelt, to Roosevelt. Uh, there are many other comparative um, studies that you can make. Um, but then I think you can compare it to the American scholar. So I want to really highlight that. And that's a connection with Emerson. Now, documenting Emerson and Marti, one of the things I, in talking with you, I know I have told some of you that we love to get new information. That's, that's what you're doing here. And, and that's one of the purpose of uh, these seminars and institutes of the 
National Endowment of the Humanities. It's, it's helping to create knowledge and share that knowledge. But we can go back in time and see that people have been, been smart about a lot of things and given us information. And so one of the first to see a connection between Emerson Martí was Gonzalo de Quesada y Miranda, the son of Martí's disciple, Gonzalo de Quesada y Arostegui. Now he did not know Martí, but his family did. And he kind of imbued that. And he, in his book, I quoted it there, uh, Faceta de Martí, I recommend it to you. It's just full of, not a biography, but it's closer to Martí in time, and it has a lot about him. And he linked his <coughs> lines, I am art among art, and then we're going to come to how to translate this. And Los Montes, Montes Soy, there's more than one way to translate it. In the mountains, I am a mountain. Anyway, he connected lines from one of the first poems in Versus Sencillos with Emerson's philosophy. Now in the picture, along with the gentleman who is seated, is Maria Mantilla. So we've talked some about her, the perhaps daughter of mm -hmm. uh, Archie. Close reading and translation. Now I'm happy to have had some small part in adding to information about Marti. Um, when I was a student at Columbia University, my Mexican professor, Andres Duarte, who had written a seminal book called Marti Writer, Marti Escritor, said, okay, I want, a, I want one of my students to write about Marti and the U.S. Uh, this professor, Andres Duarte, taught a series of courses, and they all had Marti. Justo Sierra y Jose Marti. Ruben Darío y Jose Marti. I mean, every course. So anyway, um, I decided I would take up this challenge, and, and so I read, and I read, and I read, because it meant reading all of Marti's 20, at that time, 28 volumes, 27, and it meant reading, or trying to read what he read. So I'm not an American literary specialist at all. So those of you, when we talk about these writers who know American literature better than I do, I hope you'll help, but I read. And I have to tell you, I got interested in Emerson. Mm -hmm. I, I read the poetry, and I, and I liked, uh, not, not the mountain and the squirrel, I, the, the fable, <laughs> but there are other poems that are just profound <coughs> and moving. And there's a reason he's popular. So reading, reading, I began to see sometimes, and I'll tell you, in these chronicles, sometimes where he put quotation marks, sometimes he didn't. And he wrote, by hand, so they didn't know always. So sometimes you know it's a quote, and sometimes it is a quote, and you don't know. But I recognize, oh my gosh, this is this is Emerson. This is Emerson. So what I did is I looked at a classic edition of Emerson's works, and then I footnoted all of that. This is not exciting work. It isn't. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm saying, don't you know? Don't read any more footnotes to me. But. Um, I think it gave us some information. What it showed us, too, is there's a big connection between them. And then the other thing I found reading, because I read all of these works, including the notebook, was that their Marquis notebooks have some acknowledged translations from Emerson, but there were two poems, fragments of verse in his notebooks. I thought, <coughs> this is the Emerson poem, or part of the poem, the text. And here's another one called Blight. And it's an interesting poem if you're interested in environmental issues because it says the enemy of blight and harm to nature is man. Mm -hmm. So Emerson's being read a lot in, in, in environmental studies courses now, particularly because he's so, so well equipped to define the challenges that we face environmentally. And, and what you see, just to some of you, will be able to appreciate this more than others. I'm of the era when the dissertation was typed. So these are, and that's how footnotes look. But it was still useful. Now, I think another important step in learning about Emerson and Marti is my friend Jose Bayon's 1986 book. And what he did is note these dissertations, note all of those citations in the book, and then I'll try to explain what I say here on Lante Poetico. It's more complex than I can convey quickly. But 
let me start by saying that uh, Pepe Jose Bayon looked and found there's an Emerson poem, it's really early, it's called A Mountain Grave. And it's actually just so clearly a connection to one of the poems in Versus and Sibius. And so, um, as uh, his book develops, what he says is basically that Hablante Poetico, the poetic voice, is a connection with nature. That Emerson, in his works, brings us into nature, and then we're connected to nature. And, and then Marti is doing something similar with Emerson. So it's Emerson, Marti, and then Marti to us as we read. So we're absorbing Emerson through uh, Marti. Um, and then I want to show you one example um, of how a translation of Emerson in a notebook led to a poem. And this is one line. Um, the Emerson poem, the poem Goodbye, has the line, Goodbye to Flattery's fawning face. And then Marti's translation, and this time I, I quoted the uh, critical edition, because that's the newest one that's come out now, volume 22. And Marti, translating <coughs> Emerson, put Adios al rostro mio de la And then in Versos Sencillos, just the third poem, Odio la máscara y vicio. I, I hate the masks and, and vice. Again, many ways you could express that. But you can really see that. This is just one example of several where there's a fragment in his notebooks and then you see a reflection in the poetry. Now, uh, poem number one, the very first one of the one that's appearing all the time, second stanza, and we're coming right back to what um, Gonzalo de Quesada y Miranda saw. It seems to echo concepts from Emerson's introduction to nature. So this is not, this is the introduction to nature. A very important book. Nature, and, and it's a town of science. That's how Emerson wrote it. In the common sense, refers to essences unchanged by man. Space, the air, the river, the leaf. Art is applied to a mixture of his will, man's will with the same things as in a house, a canal, a statue, a picture. And then here are these lines, the second stanza of the first poem in the book. And by the way, the, the poems are not named, they're numbered. So, um, and you have a translation in your, in your wonderful uh, selective writings by, by Esther. But I want to come down to the words art. I am art among art. And the next line, which when I translated this, I translated the word montes and monte one way, and I would translate it differently today. Here's why. Okay. Uh, and I, I want to show you too, I, I actually love the picture on this book. It's by Edicio Benitez because it had the colors, the chromatism of Verso Sencillo, and the wounded deer, and the white horse he died on, and nature. But anyway, let's get back to the poetry. All right, I am art among art, and los montes montes soy. All right, I, I took down this mountain, and I want to stop here and say, if you really study Vexus Sencillos, you're going to see that Marti used words that have more than one meaning, over and over again. So, uh, I, I'll maybe make an aside and say something that I referred to yesterday. There's a really important poem. We, I don't want to go too far astray. This is an Emerson. But there's a wonderful poem that people refer to as La Rosa Blanca, Cultivo La Rosa Blanca, right? And all over the internet. And there is a word in there. Uh, I guess you can, I, I'll try to get a comment <coughs> so you can see what I'm talking about a little more clearly. Um, he says, Cardo ni oruga cultivo. Mm -hmm. I cultivate, he's cultivating a white rose. I don't cultivate cardo, thistle, ni oruga, O-R-U-G-A. Now, that's a word with two meanings. In everyday Spanish, it means a cow, <coughs> right? Mm -hmm. So people say, oh, Marti didn't mean, I mean, that doesn't make sense. 
It's a mistype. No, remember, we have a first edition. You can look right there. We know what he wrote. And it was the word oruga, O-R-U-G-A. Some people said, oh, let's substitute Ortiga. But that's not right. And actually, the poem makes more sense with oruga, because that's like arugula, a bitter herb. So what you have is something that is harsh to the feel, this one, and harsh to the taste. It just gives it much more poetic meaning. Anyway, so I just give you that one example of how these verses seem simple, but they're not. The more you see them, the more profound they are. In fact, that's one of the things, and one of the great pleasures of my life is talking about these topics with Cynthia Vitier and his wife, Fina Garcia Marus. And they said, oh, I need, I need, don't translate the title as simple. They're not simple. Don't call these simple verses. So you see, I didn't translate them. I didn't, I didn't say simple verses, because they're not. They're honest, frank, uh, sincere verses, but they're not simple. Anyway, let's go back to this one, art among art. Now, and we've got Cubans here, so everyone can chip in. And Los Montes Montes Soy. Many people told me, and I take this meaning to, it's woodlands, it's forest, it's nature. So actually, you could say, I am art among art. In nature, I am at home. And if you translate it that way, mind you, I didn't do it the first time, uh, then you really see the connection with the introduction to Emerson's nature. Now, Guantanamera. Uh, I'll give you just a little bit of background about this. I think I was talking at lunch uh, with some of you, and we talked about Ybor City, and we were making jokes, and we said, uh, I, this goes back a while when my husband and I were living in, in the, uh, Tampa, and said something about, oh, we're going to Ybor City to see Marti, and somebody I won't name said, oh, is he singing there? And it's a connection of thinking that Marti wrote a song called Guantanamera. <laughs> now, the song Guantanamera is linked to Marti, but he didn't write it in, as a song. So let's look at a little bit of the history. Uh, and it's important because if we see Emerson in those verses, in the very first part, and those are sung in Guantanamera, then we're going to see how those ideas went around the world. So the first one, the first slide, or the first picture is Jose Fernandez. By the way, all of you from Cuba, just chip in, right? You know, I, I, I'm Argentine born, but I would love to be Cuban because of Marti. <laughs> so, um, but I don't think anyone knows Marti like Cubans, or descendiente de Cubanos como James. So um, there was a, a popular, Melody, Tonada, La Guajira, Guantanamera. It's not a girl from Guantanamo. It's a kind of music sung by Jose Fernandez. Now, in the 1940s, in Havana, there was a distinguished group that included Cynthia Vitier uh, and a musician named Julian Orbón. And in that group, Julian Orbón decided or thought that it would be a good idea to combine this popular music with verses from Marti. Now, a disciple of Turian Arbon, Hector Angulo, took that idea and went to a summer camp in the Catskills where he met Pete Seeger. And Pete Seeger loved the idea. Pete Seeger has sung Guantanamera in English and Spanish all around the world. And this is a song that because of solidarity with um, the Cuban revolution, <coughs> for a lot of different reasons, it's just, it's everywhere. I can't tell you how pervasive the idea of Guantanamera is around the world. And I'm saying this to say that in one form or another, there's a little bit of Emerson whenever people sing Guantanamera. So where, where could we find this? And if you have other examples, I hope you'll, you'll share them with me. But I will give you a couple of examples, including to the ones I've got, including the ones I've documented. Okay, there are versions of 
Guantanamera or portions of Verso Sencillo in most Western European languages, most Eastern European languages, largely because of solidarity with Cuba and the Cuban Revolution, in Russian, in Japanese, Chinese, Hebrew, Hindi, Welsh, my background, <laughs> Tagalog or Filipino, Guarani, that's an American Indian language, Paraguay, and Tocil Maya. That's just recent. I actually brought some translations from Tocil Maya to the Marti Center in Havana. These, these verses go everywhere. And I have always said, you know, people say, oh, Shakespeare is, is worldwide. Well, you know, I'm not, that's not my tradition, but Shakespeare doesn't go everywhere. But Marti does. I mean, Native American languages everywhere. So um, this is part of this worldwide reach. Now, the next thing, and I, I decided I would not try to play the music for you, but in addition to all the versions of of uh, Versos Sencillos through Guantanamera, a Spanish group called Laredo. If you haven't heard it, just, just try to get it, you know, because they have, uh, you know, musical versions of Versos Sencillos in which they really emphasize the idea of, of what we've been talking about, those verses, that fit the flexion Now, Nuestra America, I said there's a connection with um, the American scholar. So I'm trying to show you how these documents looked initially because they're really important, but they started out just like that little copy of, very humble copy of Verso Sencius that's everywhere now. It's gotten so important. So um, Emerson's um, The American Scholar, 1837, um, was given as a, a talk to the Phi Beta Kappa Society. And in fact, the Phi Beta, those of you who are Phi Beta Kappa know this, that their journal is called the American Scholar. So that was something to a small audience at a certain time, and it's really important. And Nuestra America, 1891, also very important way beyond its, its uh, beginnings. Now, some ideas from Emerson. These are just really general summations. The power of nature, nature's religion. And that, these are things that maybe you'll want to think about in groups. Nature is an equalizer. Look carefully at the word equalizer. If you think back at that example, the mountain and the squirrel, he's taught, you can look carefully at the words equity and equal. And what he's saying is, and I think it actually carried over to some extent, we can talk about that this afternoon, to his ideas about race. Because people don't have to be exactly the same to be considered equal in respect to dignity. And then uh, poetry before science. And I don't think I gave you this example. I haven't given this uh, to you in the, in, the, um, in the PowerPoint. But there is, in the very, before the introduction even, to the work nature, <coughs> the work is the introduction that we looked at that has art and, and, and nature. Um, but there's also a set of lines, and I, I'll try to get it so you can have it in writing where Emerson says, and mounting, no, and trying to be man, the worm, striving and striving to be man, the worm, mounts through all the spires of time. It's kind of a presaging of evolution. And Marti quotes that over and over <coughs> and over again. So what he was saying is, okay, a poet like Emerson can through poetry, envision what people are saying about evolution. Um, I'll give you another example. Um, walking just here in Tampa along the river wall, I'm walking along, 
and I look down, you know, there are quotes, there are pieces of art along the way, and there are quotes, and I look down, and I see Emerson. <laughs> and here's what I saw. This is, this is what I want to really reinforce. They're very similar in this way. Marti is just, he's so diffused in so many ways, in so many powerful ways, and sometimes in distorted ways. And Emerson, too, is, you know, there are quotes from Emerson everywhere. In fact, if we have time, we'll talk about the word aphorism and how that relates to both Emerson and Marti. But here is the quote, and I just love it. This is right on, if you walk on the river walk, you'll see it, too. The creation of a thousand forests is in one acorn. <coughs> Okay, so it's kind of scientific truth. But I love the way you put it as poetry. The creation of a thousand horses. You have one acorn. And that one acorn is going to have a tree. It's going to have acorns. It's going to have more trees and trees and trees. So that's the idea, I think, of uh, poetry before science. Now, impact. And I hope I can show you something here. Um, I think it's important to recognize that sometimes works that are not initially popular uh, become popular. So it's kind of, I've given you these works in their, in their native form. Uh, nature, which is, I don't know if your campus has had environmental studies courses <coughs> in my institution, San Jose State. I was part of a team that was looking at environmental issues and we looked at nature. Um, but it was a book that came out and it took many, I think, 13 years to sell 500 copies. It, it wasn't a big seller, but look at the impact today. It's just extraordinary. And then this is actually the cover of that edition that I looked at in, in Gainesville. Verso Sencillo, it's not fancy, it's just very plain, but look how those verses have gone everywhere. And then the other page is the first page of the American. The impact on the on the students? Yes, in general. You, the students. I mean, I've given them to you, and I want you to just think about how works go from something like this to worldwide fame. And that's what's happened. All of these are just way out there. What made what made them? So yes, I can give you a direct example of, of how the high school students who took the AP exam, I had the chance to grade the question this year. And some of the students gave a traditional answer of analyzing the theme of nationalism, although that was kind of problematic. But some of the students that went off tangent that couldn't really answer, their response dealt with the idea of a marginalized immigrant, of the people that come from other countries having to work twice as hard as people who live in the United States, from the United States, and really finding that connection, um, not knowing maybe if their level wasn't to that level where they could really analyze the text, but they connected with it in that way that made it very personal today. And so I think that relevance, that it could timelessness. Right. Mm -hmm. So any other ideas about why these are important? 
I like the fact that, yeah, it's Melissa. I think they also tend to, it tends to renew itself over time. The messages are so universal. We keep seeing these issues crop up over and over. I taught a survey of Latin American in the fall, so you read this about already about during all this stuff about the internment camps at the border. And I didn't bring it up. I like to let students do that so that I can. <laughs> but like, they, and they did, they brought that up, and they said, you know, here's some of these situations that we see coming over and over, the US and Latin American relationships, and the way that the US then intervenes creates these other situations that have a cascade effect, and then the US intervenes in its own border, saying, well, now we're justified because it's on our side. Then he is saying, well, yeah, but, you know, what's happening on the other side is also, you know, an issue, and she said, it's very, very complicated. And, and it was, to me, it was very interesting that the students were the ones that picked up on that and made it relevant for themselves, right? That they were finding themselves, they were finding the current issues in this piece that was written 100 years ago. And, and that, to me, was profound, profoundly interesting. And I think that's the universality of a lot of these, you know, older things, is, is whether they can be found over and over again in, in other times. I, I just, I think that's the key word, is relevance. That, that what makes these texts last is that they, that they, that they remain relevant, that they're, that they're still saying something to Not them. Not mired in their times. Right. There's a, the line I was thinking about earlier when you said, uh, in, in Matthias Emerson, he's got that great line where he says, uh, 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 science isn't false, it's just slow, well, compared to poetry. That's you know? that. And so, but it, a lot of the insights that come through these, these articles, no? To us now, seem like oh, you know, they were how, how ahead of the time they were, and so therefore they remain very relevant to us. I'm glad you said this would be about American thinkers, not just writers, because thinkers. Because I think these ideas, these uh, works, have powerful ideas, and of course, this is what Marti says. We're going to talk about it more this afternoon. Race to America. That um, you know. Nothing can plow through a cloud of ideas. There's the force of ideas, and, and that certainly comes through. Um, okay. um, I'd like to uh, read some lines to you, and tell me whether we talk about how <coughs> these two authors are uh, identified. I certainly want to know if you have any questions. But one of the things I found when I taught Maestro America in English, I usually do it in Spanish, but um, I'm sorry, I'm talking about, Mr. about Emerson. I've taught Maestro America in both languages, but I also taught the Emerson essay using uh, Esther's excellent selective writings. And teaching that in English, I asked the students in the class um, if the statements, and I'm going to read them to you, applied to Emerson, to Marti, or to both of them. So I'm going to read them, then I'll hand it out to you so you don't have it. Um, but what do you think? When a person has lived well, the hearse is a triumphal chariot. It's not a test. You're all going to pass. <laughs> okay. 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 Should I read them again? Did everyone get it? You, you all get it in a hand. But when a person has lived well, the hearse is a triumphal chariot. That sounds like Marty, doesn't it? Okay. The whole world knows who he was. Is that? Could we say that about Marty? Okay. His anger stemmed not from vanity, but from sincerity. Righteous anger. Hard, huh? You're still all going to pass. Don't worry. Okay? Um, he was not a man of his nation. He was a man of the human nation. So how, what do you say? I'm not hearing answers. I don't know if you're going to pass. <laughs> okay. Can I clarify? Yes. These are all things that Marquis says of Emerson. Yes. You're I'm asking if they apply to both of them or one or the other one. I am saying, in the essay on Emerson, should these statements be applied, can they be applied to Emerson, to Marti, or to both? Not who 
Mark Dean was talking about. That's, that's right. right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Good clarification. Okay. So, what do you think? I mean, so far, did they apply the vote? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. His pen is not a paintbrush that dilutes, but a chisel that cuts and sculpts. Yeah. <laughs> okay? All right. His pen, excuse me, uh, at times he seems to leap from one thing to another. That's <laughs> <laughs> certainly more too. <laughs> right, right, okay. Uh, some have difficulty, difficulty understanding him, for a mountain cannot be measured in inches. <clears throat> Who understood everything by Marti quickly, just like that? <laughs> okay, you're not going to pass if you say that. <laughs> All right. His ideas fall into the mind like small white pebbles on a luminous sea. What sparks, what flashes, what veins of fire? His ideas fall into the mind like small white pebbles on a luminous sea. What sparks, what flashes, what veins of fire? See the contrast in colors and shapes and everything? That's such an interesting image, too, because like when you drop pebbles in the water, the water rises, right? Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Death does not trouble or frighten the man who has lived nobly. Death does not trouble or frighten the man who has lived nobly. So, no? okay. I mean, you know, these are just open questions. You might not think they apply equally. They, as Melissa helped us clarify, these were all in the Emerson essay that Marti wrote about Emerson, right? Okay, he takes his seat at the table of heroes, fully at ease. Right? <laughs> Some of his poems are like a grove of oak trees in bloom, and other poems of his are like trickles of precious stones or shreds of cloud or shards of lightning. Oh. I'll just pause. If these sound poetic, that's because they had a great translator. <coughs> All right? <laughs> and you're going to get these with the references to selective writing. So you can look them up, because that's what I used when I did this. All right. Now, when I did this with a class, you don't have to agree, but they all said, well, I think really, it sounds like both of them at the same time. And I think it's an option. We, we can pass these out now, and you can look for yourself. Um, there's one other item here that may be useful to you. Um, this is actually uh, from a draft of a chapter, <laughs> and it happened, and I had to, um, yeah. <coughs> okay, I'll mention two other things on this handout. Um, it's a draft for my chapter in the MLA volume. And I had all these examples, and they said, oh, no, you have to cut it down, you have to cut it down. So in the published version, there are just two examples. But I liked all of them because they worked as a class exercise where people could just think about it. And to me, the fact that so much of what Marti wrote about Emerson applied to himself is one of their identifications. Now, they both wrote similar forms. They both wrote poetry and essay. And, and I'll actually do more of this with uh, Luis de America this afternoon. But they also um, really were both famous for aphorisms, uh, aphorismos. Pithy sayings are not, they're not problems, they're not something well known like that, but they establish a truth. And, and actually, uh, Emerson, just like, The creation of a thousand forests is in one acorn. That's really an aphorism, a truth expressed. Um, you may have heard of the one I think that's very commonly associated with Emerson, 
Uh, to be great is to be misunderstood, right? People even think, well, it's Emerson or the Bible. I mean, that's what people tend to say here. Anyway, Marti translated that along with many others. But it is one thing they have in common. They, so I think Marti saw in reading about Emerson and obviously reading some Emerson, some text of Emerson, that there were things that Emerson did that were like what he did. So, um, no, I want to just mention something at the top of the page you've just been handed out. Um, I've tried to mention some places you can get information that can be useful. So remember, this is just the easiest way for me to get you this information was just to take the page from the draft chapter. So. Um, but in that, I mentioned something that I'm a big believer in, and that is the Library of Congress. I, I tell every student, okay, I'm going to write this on the board, loc.gov, loc.gov. But it's just so easy. You don't have to just, just, and you're going to get this treasury of resources about the United States and about Latin America, an exposition, I mean, ex Exhibition English, an exhibition about Whitman, uh, so many other things. It's just rich in resources. I, I think way overlooked. And so one of the things um, that I want to re reference for you particularly is on that site, the Library of Congress website, Chronicling America. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the great things they've done. They have digitized newspapers. Uh, 19th century newspapers. When I first started researching, I remember actually big volumes of crumbling newspapers, but they're digitized. You know, you have to work a little to find out how to, how to get to the sources, but get the date, get the topic, and you can just go to hundreds and hundreds of newspapers of the era of Marti, right, or maybe other things that you're studying. I know this is a very diverse group. You have history and communications and, and literature and uh, I, I know I'm leaving out some basic fields. Anyway, lots of different areas of expertise in the humanities. And you can go get these sources and, and clip and cut and you're just going to find a treasure trove of information uh, through that. So I hope you'll look at it. And again, I want to remind you about Harper's Weekly. This, this is something I've been doing for a long time. Looking for where did Marti get, where, did, where is this from? And I know we have somebody here who's worked on the critical edition of Marti's work that they're publishing at Centro de Estudios Marcianos. And, you know, I and my humble part have tried to locate some of the things. I got a request from Pedro Pablo for a quote it's something about James Russell Lowell. You'll see I talk about a lot of authors in that book. So here's the quote that Marti translated. Where is it from? These are, these are writers that wrote a lot. Um, so you kind of have to guess where he I think I found it. But uh, what I want to suggest <coughs> to you is that looking at these sources of information can help you find out the kind of America that Marti was living in. What did he what did he see when he had these newspapers in front of him? Now, I wish I could tell you for sure what um, text of Emerson that Marti had. I you know, I would love to say that. I looked in the Council of State in Havana of the books in English in Marti's library when I was researching for this book. And I didn't find there was something called a patriotic reader. And that was interesting because it was one of the books that Marti had in English and it had references to some American writers. But I didn't find a copy of Emerson's book. I just don't know. I simply don't know. But I recommend that to you. Um, so let me ask you if you have any questions. We're going to take a quick break before we look at Walt Whitman. Uh, but let me ask if you have any questions about Emerson and MIT or, or comments. You want to improve your grade. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, Miguel. Uh, thank you for that and, and for this uh, excellent text as well. I really uh, enjoyed it. And um, you mentioned on page 28, the second 
What a right. good question. A story. Sorry. Good. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, again, those of you in American literature, I, I read a lot of Emerson. I actually got interested in Emerson. So then I look, I see Emerson on the river walk here in Tampa. Um, I think um, 1882 is the date of the essay. And remember that these obituaries and comments about the writing are still true. I recommend to you two New York Times, those of you who teach Latin American literature, you want to know something about Carlos Fuentes or somebody else, look at the New York Times coverage. It's a wonderful, succinct way of look at, at, at looking at what those authors have done in their, in their lifetime. Okay, in the case of Emerson, tranquil. And in fact, um, you know, you have the whole wonderful essay beautifully translated. So you see what he said about Emerson. And I think, in some ways, I'm just supposing this, that probably Marty was a little envious. I mean, here's some, look at the house. And you know, Marty wasn't living in a house like that, right? And a, a calm life. Uh, Marty many times says you have to suffer to really, now, he didn't convey that Emerson suffered a lot, and at the same time, he really admired Emerson, but in other instances, for example, Longfellow, he says he didn't suffer enough. And because Marti didn't know enough about Longfellow. Yeah. Marti, I mean, Longfellow did suffer. He just didn't know that. So to get back to your question, Miguel, he, I think he saw, here is a man, I mean, what can you say about Emerson that's bad, right? He's a, he's a noble figure. He also was way out there. Some people today may take issue with it, but he was anti-slavery, right? Uh, he was on kind of the right side of history in so many ways. I'll wait to talk about this, but he, when we talk about Marti and Grace and the question of John Brown, we just wait on that because there's a lot of history to it. He tended to be way out there, uh, we'd say that today to the left on these issues, things that Marti would appreciate. Um, but he didn't he wasn't living, living in a boarding house in Brooklyn. His wife didn't believe him, right? So he, I think he envied him, but he also thought, okay, here's somebody, look at the tributes that are paid to him. Um, he's going to go down in history as somebody you knows. That's what I took away from him. So it's more about his life than his death. Right. Okay. But the, you know, again, refer to the, to the wonderful translation you have. You know, he's just so effusive when we'll talk after our break when we talk about women and about the big differences between them. And I want you to think about also where this article, this chronica went. It's important to think about where it went and then how it, you know, how, how do we know about Emerson? Is it through Lopinia No, we'll talk about that after we talk about women. Or is it through Guantanamera? I mean, this is a topic for those of you who do Latin American studies. There's certainly more now, not, nothing immediate, much more about Emerson than Latin American, right? But, um, right. So, yes. I'm, I'm struck. Martin's only 29 when he writes this. Right? Right. He's 1882, he published it. So he's only 29. So as I'm reading it, I, I'm thinking out this. There you go. What he wants for his own writing. Okay. At the, time, at the same time, it seems that he's almost projecting his style onto Emerson. So he's finding in Emerson his own sorts of. Oh, I, I think, so I think you, there's, there's that dialogue. A plus. 
Sometimes it's just in passing, and so um, those are the two, and they're 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 interesting to compare and contrast. He writes about both of them, and both in both cases, what he writes is important, um, but he identifies much more with one. And then there's another. I, I want to leave some of these things. We're going to talk about Ramona also, but later in the context of Marti and race cast very broadly, race, racial terminology, et cetera. Can I just mention, yeah. um, there's a, something that I included is a, 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 an account of a funeral of a Chinese general oh, yes. in yes. Chinatown. Right. And I think that very much that same kind of thing is going on. It's the, a nationalist hero who's being celebrated by his people. And you can just feel, as Marquis writes about it, uh, he sees himself in this figure. Um, very, very much. Because, it, yeah, and it goes beyond the sense of, I mean, maybe maybe the identification is the right word, but I think it's almost like a transfiguration into another persona as a way of him developing his own sense of character. You know, another way to look at this is to contrast what he wrote when he wrote favorably about somebody with what he wrote about the horrible politicians of his time. You know, uh, you just you know, we can't, get, there's just so many examples, but um, I think there's basically a big divide between what he wrote about most writers, not all, but most, and what he wrote about a lot of the politicians. I, I would just note also that when you visit the Central East of the 20th, I spent a lot of time, what it says under the door is on rar, on rar. Yes. And I think Marquis... Did everyone get yeah. that on rar, on rar to be our voice? To, to, to honor, honor to be honor is right. to bring honor onto right. yourself. But, but you, there's no way to translate it as concisely as it's no, written in Spanish. No. But so that Martins of the hero worship, for him is almost an act of um, ennobling himself by, by seeing others with this intensity of admiration. And then that becomes like what's written over the door of the central history of the So any comments? Yeah, more? Comments or questions? Yes. Yes. Um, so, when you talk about that quote that you said, Yahweh, yeah, the one that inspires. Yes, and striving through, wait a minute, and stri I should have given it to you. It's, and striving to be man, the worm mounts through all the spires of time. It presages, he saw that as presaging, it's right the preface before the introduction to the book Nature. So you can find it online easily. And he saw it as a presaging of evolution. Oh, so that's a quote from Marquis? That's a quote from, from Emerson. From Emerson. Right. 
but Marti, but it's a good question you say because Marti puts it over and over and over again in his notebooks. And that's why I put that thing, science is indebted to poetry. Mm -hmm. But also the quote about a thousand fours are in a single acorn, that's kind of scientific too. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say this. Uh, Rafa Rojas has a really great piece about uh, aphoristic writing oh. in uh, Nietzsche mm -hmm. and, and makes a comparison between that and Martí. And he talks about Nietzsche's The Gay Science mm -hmm. and this idea of being able to synthesize thought, to synthesize mm -hmm. huge amounts of information in, in, in very small phrases, you knowing that that's the, the, art, the, the, the capacity of poetry. You know, to, to, to synthesize uh, great ideas. You know, it's so really an interesting my real comparison. My question, though, is are there any, um, what are the divergences between Emerson and Marquis? What are they what? Divergences. So where do they diverge? Yeah, so you, um, in the book you talk a lot about the engagement, you talk a lot about the identification and the um, and where And where do they differ? Where do you see them as different? Or where do you see Marquis? I don't know whether I should get into this swamp or not. Because <laughs> um, there has been a voice that sees a, a divergence. Uh, I don't happen to agree with, but let me just avoid that and say, because uh, I don't think it's based on factual, careful reading. But you're just really looking at where do these two individuals diverge? Well, I think I, at one point, actually in the book, I say they couldn't have been more dissimilar physically. You know, it's sort of a, amazing that this Marti with the bushy mustache and this serene example of anguish sometimes and maybe feverish and all of that. And I think I've told some of you depicted as Dura Lambre Vivo, just a live wire and Emerson seeming so calm. So they were not, their, their life experiences were so different. Their, circumstances of life and fortune were so different. But what I see as a similarity is the way that the, the um, categories in which they wrote and the impact that they had. That you just, you see Emerson, you know, he's, as I say, now he's in all the environmental studies courses. And both of those are figures who more important in their time, their importance has grown and expanded. I don't think I'm answering your question. I'm not going to pass. Okay, so rephrase, please. How, how are they divergent as writers, as individuals, as thinkers? As thinkers? In their written work. So what would you say are some of the differences in the, in the written work? Okay, and you know, um, actually, let me refer to one more thing. Accessibility, certainly. Um, I'm trying to find what, here we go. I was going to say this, but um, uh, because it actually kind of refers to Noise of America, which has ideas about race, which we're going to talk about this afternoon. But uh, the American scholar, I don't. You know, we don't have to have that work in front of us to, to talk about it. I actually reread The American Scholar because it's considered a, um, a kind of a declaration. I think I'm trying to think of longer way to home. Somebody called it Declaration of American Literary, American Cultural Independence. That's the idea. That it's a little bit like. Um, what Pepe Bayon was saying in the title of his book, Autonomia Cultural Americana, that there's cultural autonomy. So in a very broad general sense, Emerson is saying we have to, particularly in work like uh, in Western America, uh, our America, that we have to create our own literature and the Americans have to have their own voices speak. And in a very different context, Anglo-Saxon world, New England, um, 
or much earlier, we're talking about the 1830s, Emerson, and this was a, actually a lot of criticism. He got a lot of criticism for the American scholar because he, instead of praising all that his, the people he was looking at, out, you know, these people in the Phi Beta Kappa Society, uh, the kind of work they were doing, he says, no, uh, we have to put aside these things from the past. We have to look to the common man. I'm going to see a, a little bit of equipment there, too, but let me just read a few things. I went back and read The American Scholar again. Um, so I'm kind of jumping ahead of what we'll do this afternoon. But um, these are quotes that I wrote, just handwritten, from my rereading of The American Scholar. And you can always compare this to what we saw with Emerson, MRT, and the Emerson essay. Okay, that's quote number one. You must take the whole society to find the whole man. I think that's right in most of many, all right? Um, he also says, um, nature is indispensable to the scholar. Here's another one. Each age must write its own books. The books of an older period will not fit this. Right? He says, don't rely on the path to classics. Um, you, some of you may like this, and your students may like it. Colleges should not seek to drill, but to create. Mm -hmm. And that's an idea of a budget. Mm -hmm. um, and then, OK, the literature of the poor, the feelings of the child, the philosophy of the street, the meaning of household life are all topics of the time. And then the last one is very much in tune with that idea of um, cultural autonomy, independence from Europe. He says, this is all from the American scholar, right? 1837, God bless you. We have listened too long to the courtly muses of Europe. That's very similar to some lines in well, I think it's time to take a break. So we'll come back and look at where it's going to be. It's going to be short. Another hand. Right? Because <laughs> Marti wrote about Goodman, but I think you're going to see that it's a different approach. Uh, the first thing to see, though, is that there is person <coughs> in Whitman. So these are influences that just go through lots of ways you can't pin down the certain people. <coughs> Probably there. Um, Emerson's letter to Whitman of July 1855, don't you see the handwriting of the time? Uh, Called Leaves of Grass, the most extraordinary piece of Whitman wisdom that America has yet contributed. Now, Whitman, I have to add here, without the permission of Emerson, published a letter in an October 1855 newspaper and in the second edition of Leaves of Grass. And getting an endorsement from Emerson was a great boost to Whitman's literary career. So, there go. Um, Whitman's, the main reason that we have this big essay about Whitman in uh, Marquis Caronicas is in connection with the Lincoln Lecture in New York held April 14, 1887. Now, Again, I really am going to ask for the help of those of you in American literature who know these writers better than I do to chip in and help. But I did realize that I did read enough to take in that. Of course, um, Whitman, who had an interest in death, was very moved and was much of the nation by the death of Lincoln. And he gave, he had a series of Lincoln lectures that were based, uh, that would fall on the approximate date of Lincoln's assassination. So this is one of several lectures that he gave. But this one is held in New York. And I thought I would show you a picture of how Lincoln looked in 1887. Um, and also a, a ticket uh, or a, 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 you know, a, a notice about Whitman lecture held at Madison Square Garden. I think originally, and I may have even said this in the book, that Marti probably attended the lecture. I don't know. 
I, I used to think so, but um, because there are a lot of times where Martin will say, he'll picture himself as walking through an exhibit or doing something. Maybe he was there, and maybe he read about it. Or, I want to keep emphasizing this, like Adiela Schneermacher <coughs> said, graphics, you see pictures, graphics. And particularly the ones in the Harper's Weekly, they're big and you can't, you know, you, you get this big visual image. In any event, he used that as a starting point to write about what he Now, Marti alluded to works in the 1881-82, that's the seventh edition of Leaves of Grass. And I tried to show you the spine of a book uh, so you would see approximately how thick it was, this 1881-82 edition. Now, from my reading, what I have gleaned is the first edition of Leaves of Grass was a slender volume. And what Whitman did do was keep adding to it. He added to it. He changed, he, he embellished the butterfly image on the spine as his creation. He took a lot of interest in the uh, details of the appearance of his wreaths of grass. But, and we can't know for sure what text Marti was looking at when he gave, and we're going to see lots of translations of lines from Whitman, but he alludes to the 1881-82 seventh edition because it was an edition that uh, was suppressed by the Boston printer because it seemed too salacious. Mm -hmm. So it's also considered a standard edition. And I just want you to take it as a pretty thick book. Now, that book has collections. I say that because when you read about Marti's references, Calamus, by the way, that's a kind of tall grass, right, is a collection under Calamus in leaves of grass. So there's leaves of grass, and then there are these collections within that big text, and then there are individual poems. So what I'm going to show you here is that these are just two collections that he mentioned, and then there are individual poems that he named, right, um, and then we're going to see there, there are many more lines that he quoted. All right. Martinez's essay had nearly 70, when I say nearly 70, <coughs> phrases, lines, just little individual portions from Whitman. And Luis Baralt, he was the son of uh, parents who knew Martí in New York. Um, it's a very good book, I think, Martí on the USA. Um, he, in his book, in the footnotes, documented more than 40 references to Whitman. So uh, he, he showed how much was there that I identified and cited others in my book, St. Marti and U.S. Writers. So it's a work in progress. Um, I wanted to show you uh, a cover of an edition of Just When the Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloomed, uh, because that's the date, 1865 following Lincoln's death. And I want to mention, too, again, those of you in American literature, please help us out. Um, there are two major poems that I'm aware of about Lincoln that Whitman wrote. And one of them is, Oh, Captain, My Captain, right? It resonates. It's short. It's easy to remember. People like it, so it's out there. And then the other is much more diffused. It's a beautiful elegy when lilacs last in the dooryard and uh, And we'll talk a little bit about what Marti did with that. Now some descriptors. Um, and I want to come back and tell you that um, I think when Marti described the work when lilacs last in the dooryard bloom, he, he gave a couple of lines, but basically he described it. And, but he didn't really describe the importance of the lilac. And I want to say this because Marti got a lot of things right, but he didn't get everything right. And the reason the lilac is important is that where Whitman lived at the time of Lincoln's death, it was the time
time when lilacs bloomed in Brooklyn. So they were always a remembrance uh, for him of the time that Lincoln died. We don't, we don't want to fault Marty for that, but just to say that he went <coughs> fast, and I think you want to remember he was oh, we almost always writing fast. And so, and he sometimes made some factual errors when we talk about Marty and Race. I'll try to remember to tell you some things he got wrong about Frederick Douglass and other people. But um, the main thing here is that Marty did express a lot of Whitman in Spanish. And then, what were his descriptors? And I think you can see, the illustration, by the way, is that's just bravada. <coughs> that's just snatched from the internet. Sorry, I'm not ever going to put it in a book. I always ask permission for every illustration. But I tried to find something that sort of conveyed Whitman, and this is from an edition. And so you see the male body, vigorous, that's certainly in Whitman. And, um, you know, a new dawn and people and the masses. So all of that seemed to convey Whitman. Now, the scriptures, what did Marti, how did he describe Whitman? He didn't say a lot about his life. He did not. Uh, and you can find, if you have other ways that, or other words you think are appropriate, robust, revolutionary, sensual, virile, viril. V-I-R-I-L. Marty loved that word. He was virile, and he loved it. <laughs> so, um, he liked that. He also called it, think of how different these are from Emerson. Audacious, prophetic, and here's the one that really makes a difference. Strange. I tried to think of any way that he called Emerson strange. Those of you who have read the, the Whitman essay, what do you see? What what are you seeing? And particularly those of you who know this literature better. Well, how do you know? How do you know Whitman, those of you who know him? I mean, it's a canon in American literature. I didn't grow up here, so but how do people learn about him in classrooms? Some of you did. Some of you went to school here and you know what they teach, right? So what do you learn about what? <coughs> Nobody read it. I think we're reading them now. You would never know about them. I don't know if you the U.S. But in so, Cuba, many of us will learn okay. about Whitman through Marti. Okay. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, like, oh, yes. I didn't know about his classes. Yeah. Um, it's, like, he's always described to me anyway, like the quintessential American literary figure of the century. Like, okay, I love that poetry, description. Right? You know, quintessential American. Yeah, poetry. breaking with the form and like big sprawling lines. Big sprawl. See, this is really good. It goes beyond what said. Big sprawling lines. And the content. So keep going. Keep uh, you're giving us good ones. <laughs> <laughs> a plus right here. You know, uh, the iconoclastic. Um, yes, iconoclastic. Good. I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah. How iconoclastic? Uh, well, he was censored. Or in what way? Um, yeah. I mean, the, the sexuality is a yes. big part of it. You mentioned like censorship and things. That, like, uh, you know, it's like a. Uh, definitely a. Uh, relationship, if you want to call it that, between that and patriotism and nationalism or something that's kind of built together and tied together. Okay, and, uh, yeah, so when they definitely learn very similar to what he's saying, and I think that there is um, a little bit of a tension growing up in, in school about women in New York City about uh, this idea that he's associated with nature and natural writing a lot, um, but he is an urban person. I mean, Long Island, Brooklyn, New York. Yeah, and so when I try to convey that when I teach women in the classroom is by using a recording of women's voice where you can hear his like, thick um, Brooklyn accent uh, <laughs> coming out. It's like one of the oldest, one of the earliest recordings, right? And so kind of pairing that with... I didn't know that. So we have a recording? Yeah. Did you, oh, if you Whitman. just Google like Whitman recording, of, unless there's like some way in which it's been proven false or something that I don't know about, it's 
Okay. I love that. So. Yeah, so you can you can find it um, pretty easily. And actually, Levi Jeans used the, it's him reading the poem America. And uh, okay. they used it for a commercial um, as well. So I kind of also use the commercial to talk about how like poetry can enter You teach poetry. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is what I was hoping for. Yay. <laughs> okay. Well, I did not know that. And you know, we all want to know what Marty sounded like. So what's the date? I mean, what's the, I'm trying to remember when Griffin died. What, what's the date of the recording? Um, that I don't know off the top of my head. Because there were, that's the thing we know that technological advances, there were ways to record photography, lights, and so many technological advances. And I remember I had the great fortune of being in the home of uh, Roberto Fernandez by Tamar, where an Ivan, Ivan Shulman uh, my husband and I were sitting there talking about what else, Marty? And they said, everyone said, well, we just had his voice, you know, we just we just had his voice and we know what he sounded like. And we don't. So if anyone ever finds it, yeah. You know, so it's on YouTube and it says 1890, but yeah, that's just like the so first right. So, you know, maybe, yes. Yeah. 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 I um, often teach my students about lots of contradictions about America that he talks about. Whitman. Um, Whitman. Yes, yeah. okay. Lots of contradictions. We also talk about uh, his love for the common man. Yeah. Even though he might not have been necessarily speaking to them before them. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about a lot of these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And also how he grows as an individual, right? Because he did start off with like 12 poems, I think. In the yes, first very first small. Right. Edition, mm -hmm. And then it's like, who knows how many at the end. Yeah, the death bed edition, right? He revised it 31 times. 31 See, there are the details we need. Yeah. Lots of revisions. All the way up to 1892. Right. And so in 1892, it's a thick volume. And so we talk about like the growth of man or the growth of an individual. What does the eye mean? Okay, well, this is just wonderful. Now, this information. I, I teach as part of uh, environmental policy oh. about how the thought of environmental policy has evolved over time in the United States. So from that transcendental concept of liberation. So there's a there's a freedom in this writing. There's a there's a humanness that's expressed in sort of a natural humanness, right? So he talks about that in all different facets. Uh, that's for us in sort of like human liberation. Right. And We're in lots of ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I had an interesting experience with Whitman um, in uh, when in 2017, I did a lot of political protesting. I imagine lots of people in this room. <laughs> and my, <laughs> my protest sign was in line from uh, Whitman because uh, it, if you go to New York City, there is a memorial at 7th Avenue and Greenwich Avenue to the victims of AIDS. And they did an extraordinary thing with that memorial. You see sort of flying white triangles and you don't really know what it is and you walk up to it. Have, have you seen it? Have you been there? And the entirety of um, Song of Myself is engraved in a spiral on the ground. Oh, wow. So it's wow. like you walk out over this like ocean of poetry that's like swirling around your feet. And I had this experience of like walking out over it. And I looked down at my foot, and right next to my foot was the line, are you the president? It is a trifle. They will more than arrive there, everyone, and still pass on. And I was like, whoa. So that was my protest sign. And because um, it gave me hope, right? Whitman had already denounced this situation, you know, like right. more than a century ago. And I was denounced uh, protesting on the Upper West Side. I was approached by a group of uh, people in their 20s, people of color, and uh, one young woman who was an educator. She was a public school teacher, she told me. She said, uh, do you know who Walt Whitman was? And I said, uh, he was a great American poet. And she said, he was a racist. He was a racist, and he published racist writing, and I am not going to teach my students about Walt Whitman. They should not be reading that racist, and you should not have him on your sign. Um, and then I realized that there's actually a huge backlash against Whitman, which I hadn't really known before, but yeah, it's been very problematized um, by a lot of people of color. Um, because of the writings that have surfaced by him that, that clearly do not equate with the way that we write about race today. Well, he supported the genocide of Native Americans. Yeah. And he had strongly negative views.
feelings towards African Americans, although he was anti-slavery. He, he had, you, you know, I'm, that's where this is very helpful to have these perspectives. How much uh, Marti read, of, there's a lot of that Marti wrote about uh, Native Americans in the United States. I don't remember any connection with Whitman or, so I think he saw some text and looked at that. Uh, and he then wouldn't he, necessarily been aware of those things. Right, because right. he's reading no, the poetry, I don't think he's not that. reading these. And these are things that Whitman published as a journalist in, in New York right. City papers way before right. Marty arrived that have only come to light right. you know, with, with, with a lot of intensive scholarship in the last 15 years. But there is this revaluation of Whitman that's going on in light of these reasons. You know, on the plane, these things are so timely. On the river walk, there's Emerson. On the plane, there was something about Whitman, and it's something like WhitmanInitiative.com or something. There's, and there are um, exhibitions. Uh, but yes, we are reevaluating as we should. Um, I don't know whether you think Mark Twain and some things he writes are equivalent at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people do, don't want to read works because they have negative char you know, characterization. <coughs> anyway, that's, I think that's, you know, Marti didn't seem aware of that. But I'm curious about the, the notion that you brushed aside suggestions of witness on sexuality. Yeah. Right. Um, what makes you say that? Because you said there's some who suggest this, and then he puts it in, you know, he puts it in classical terms. He doesn't even want to say that that maybe there was homosexuality. He's just kind of. Did you? Are you thinking of Sylvia Malloy? I, well, I actually read that statement very differently. Okay. Um, I read right. it as Marquis being a consummate politician. Right. Um, and just being. Which he was a consummate politician, and he under, and he understood that there was no reason to waste energy stirring up needless controversy. Right. Um, so he couches it, and he says, you know, he celebrated the love of men, but without falling into it. And then he mentions two very obscure classical, classical references. Right. But if you look them up, they're both people who were homosexuals, but exploitative. In one case, of a slave, in another right. case, of a young child. Um, and so what he's actually doing is deliberately detaching homosexuality from um, sexually predatory behavior. Right. And, um, but only for those who will follow through right. and catch the reference. Um, so I actually saw that particular line as um, saying there's nothing necessarily wrong or predatory about homosexuality. Uh, that was my reading of it, uh, as, as being more less indicative of saying Whitman wasn't all the same, well, but, but more saying, um, you know, there's, there are perfectly benign forms of homosexuality, and Whitman celebrated them. Um, I, I so I think we have a that. different reading I, there. I yeah. saw Marti as very much, I mean, this is what's good about the discussion. I saw Marti as very much a product of his time and his attitude about women and his attitude about homosexuality, and thinking of his public, who, He's sending this article to La Nación with all this distribution. I don't know. I, I took it as a very, a way of very gently, that's why I said brushed aside. I, I mentioned the uh, name Sylvia Malloy because she has an article about this and she says, if, I don't want to go into this too much. Most of you are not, or a lot of you are not you know, primarily specialist in literature, but she rereads Whitman and says that she starts with, I'm trying to make it really short, there's more, more to say about uh, Whitman and, and uh, Marti. But Sylvia Malloy, this is back in the 90s, I think, 99, maybe 98. Anyway, she says that, first of all, and he's my Leo, this is a father who's really attached to his son. Hmm, what about that? Uh, I don't see that at all in East My Leo, the poems to his son. I, I see a father devoted to his son. I, I, you know, I just, all my family experiences, I just didn't get that. But then she goes on to talk about the Whitman essay and to say, give instances of the times that Marquis says, I love him. 
I went back and looked, and there are so many instances where Marti is talking about somebody, and he says, I love him. I love her. I, I, I just, I don't see anything besides an affirmation of affection in that. I just didn't read anything more. But this is why we have discussions. And this is why it's good that we have scholars to bring in these insights. So yes. Anyway. Yeah, I was just going to say that I, I, I've always seen a lot of connection between uh, this essay and the essay of Emerson in the sense that the Whitman essay is framed as that Whitman's great virtue is in a way he embodies this, uh, there's a critique of over-intellectualization, a critique of, uh, of intellectuals, of academics, that they form us into like three molds, I think he, he calls it, and, and, and they, they take away our nature. And what he likes about women is that women seems to be this truly free, natural man. But there are some phrases where he says things like, you know, uh, where he exalts that, and then he says, but with the exception of, of some aberrational things, you know, and this is a product of his, of his liberty. And, and, you know, he kind of leaves it there, what are these aberrational so, things? Right, yeah. there's so many times we can't know for sure, you know? Well, things to think about, yeah. but... Um, now, what is for sure, and I do have a handout for you, and some other things for you to think about. Um, what is for sure is that, and then we'll talk at the very end about the, the spread of information through the two newspapers. I think that's something not highlighted enough. Because one essay was sent to La Opinion Nacional, Caracas, and the other was sent to La Nacion. I'm going to have some comments about that. All right, so anyway, this is factual. We know this. Ruben Daria was inspired. Oh, I think I maybe, let's see. Oh, yes, I, I want to highlight this. Just as Emerson had boosted Whitman, so Marquis' exuberant enthusiasm and gave wings to his verse for the readers of La Nación. Now, Ruben Darío, and I know we have a Darío specialist here, so we want to count on that expertise. Uh, he was inspired by the essay published and published a poem called Walt Whitman. In the second edition, for those of you who are not versed in Spanish-American literature, Ruben Darío, a Nicaraguan poet, is responsible for launching a renovation in Spanish letters that typically goes by the name modernismo, not to be confused with the English term modernism. What he did is just break out forms of verse and, and really shake up uh, poetry in the Spanish speaking world, trivializing what's a much more complex issue. But but this man, Ruben Darío, uh, is important. And he was inspired by Martín essay and the book that we think about him using to kind of launch this movement is Azul, 1888. In the second edition of 1890, he included a poem called Walt Whitman. And this is where, again, I'm going to ask for somebody to help me hand out. I, I thought you could see the poem and see it in translation. So then you can tell me how you think Latin America is. So um, it's up on the screen, but um, it's short. And you can tell me whether you think it sounds like Whitman. Um, what we know is that the men not here, because remember, he's this important part of figure. So if he writes this in a book that's transforming poetry in the Americas, and in Spain, the Spanish-speaking world, then that name is going to get out there. Right? So it's really through Dario that Walt Whitman gets his entree into Latin America. There's one last thing. I've, this is double-sided. Um, and the, the first side, which has the Spanish, also has the last line of a translation of Marti's essay on Whitman. And the last lines are different from the translation.
contemplation that Pastor Allen gives, that Louise Baral gives, and we can. Well, I'm going to emphasize why context in the in the case of translation matters. So here's a published translation. So take a look at the at the poem. What do you think? Since you have it in both languages. I mean, those of you who read Spanish tell me the thing. I didn't try to analyze it. Yeah, I mean, this is a main way that Walt Whitman became known. Marti, remember how these go? Emerson to Whitman to Marti, now I have Marti to Dario to Latin America. Whitman going that way. Okay. Yes? It's, it's, pretty much, it's pretty much the same image that Marti gives us about Whitman. And the, the way we learn about it was Whitman through Marti mm -hmm. and Marti through the eyes of Dario. So, 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 you know, so, so, what I see is a, it's a very close what he's saying here right. to what Marti says about Whitman. Daniel had different phases. I, again, I think this is a institute with people from many different disciplines, so I don't want to just act like it's a Spanish American literature course, but Daniel had many phases, and his very first phase is very, was quite different from from this poem, but then his poetry evolved. So any comments about how Dario absorbed Marti's Whitman? Okay. Well, one is that the Whitman that appears in Marti and the Whitman that appears in Dario are, is the old Whitman, mm -hmm. this figure, this God figure, the, the big lion. white beard, this yeah. imperial. Yeah. It's not the young Whitman of the first leaves of grass. Right, right. You no, know, and that with the little hat and, you know, right. kind of looking. <laughs> The, the young man. Maybe just put himself. Right. So it's a very it's it's this authoritarian, uh, not a, a authoritarian in, in aspect, not in tone, but a sort of imperious Whitman. You know? Does he care? What does he say? Why en su país de guerra? Is that from is that from Martin? Sounds like a Marti image. Sounds like a, something. Okay, like a, I have to hear you. Yeah, sounds like a Marti image. It's something Marti says, and, and he describes the United States as a, a theater, like a mechanical land or land of machines and steam. It's also not to Russo. Like, yeah. like when he describes right. the same kind of topics regarding right. the U.S. when he's talking about Russo. And you teach yeah. women, so. Mm -hmm. um, wait, um, in English, don't you teach? Oh, I was talking about how Marti New York. Oh yes, yeah. okay. that's what I was um, was explaining of, of that. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think? How how would this reach people? Well, it reached people through the book, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's important. Anything else about how it conveyed? Comments? I would. I would. Yes, oh, yes sorry, over here because we want comments from everybody. We want everyone to pass this course. I think the, this Whitman is very controlled and like very kind of like obsessive about craft in a way that again is I think that you know, maybe like projecting himself into Whitman, you know, like because it's certainly at this moment in that not as free as Whitman. Yeah, and certainly at this moment in that there's like an obsession with him chiseling things out, right? Like, um, I mean, there's also in us there's also not his later space, yeah, right? There's like the story about the gnomes under the earth who are like chiseling out all the rocks and stuff like that, right? Um, this is, and so it's because there's, you know, it's, it's precisely like not uh, 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 Whitman who almost like, this is like one with nature. This is like uh, Whitman who's kind of like, you know, uh, uh, presiding over nature. Um, I also think that with Dario, the país de hierro might not be a bad thing. Like he's, I mean, he's like, he is almost such a kind of like, uh, I, I don't know, a precise kind of cold poet. It's, it's, it seems like a kind of, you know what I mean at this moment? He's trying to make women in the one piece. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, what about, um, you know, I'm not looking at the Spanish here, the prophet singing his song. 
long. I forget exactly how. So I wanted to make sure everyone had a version in English, and then um, just the format is Death to the Eagle. I see a lot of imagery of uh, industrialization, the okay. worker, steel. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, uh, you know, it's not nature for sure. It's mm -hmm. something else. Maybe right. a little we don't nature. see nature here. Yeah, not no. yeah. What I, I was going to say something similar very quickly that um, what I see in Darío and what I see in Marie uh, and Martín is is Whitman's there, but the, it's also all about the United States. And right, it's about and I'm it's thinking. about their reaction to the United States, what the United States represents, trying to understand what the United States is. So it's not just how they see Whitman; it's how they see the whole U.S. Mm -hmm. Right. This is 1890. Can I something? I was talking to you about this early before we started. I'm guessing I'm venturing an idea that. Martí and Darío were putting forth the elements of what they later called La Trinidad, which is this supposition between the Latino or the Latin race or the Latin bloc or the Latin ideology the stems from the, coming from the Romans and the whole thing versus the new modernity or incarnated, uh, represented by the United States and industrialized nations. And I think you see something like that opposition here that the Latinos versus the Americanos, or Latin versus Americans, and it's Marti plays with that, and, and so does Darío very often. Yeah, I, absolutely. I, 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 I need to write this more coherently, but it's something that I've seen in Azul constantly, and in, in which he doesn't do it only with <coughs> Latin America versus the United States, but also in some kind of a position with Europe as well. Although not necessarily a positional, I mean not confrontational necessarily, but also like a friendly cordial combination or response. Anxiety of Influence from the 1970s, he talks about the way that poets have an agonistic relationship yeah. with their forebears and try to kill them off in order to make space for their own poetry. Mm -hmm. And that's the opposite of this pattern. Rather, we're seeing these poets embrace, enthrone, and lionize right. the literary, yeah. the, uh, and of course, it's, uh, this is all masculine, just as everyone in Harold Bloom's book was masculine. But uh, like to, to build a lineage uh, as if they sensed the precarity of the status of, say, Whitman. Like in Marti's time, Whitman's status still would have been more precarious. And he's saying, I want to make him into this patriarch. I want to have him as a lineage I can look back to. And so I think that's really interesting that it's the reverse of the pattern that Carl Bloom describes uh, as animating mm. literary tradition. Mm -hmm. The Bloom thing, though, he says only the greatest poets like yeah. accomplish that. Like so, like we say, Marti is like failing or something. He's not breaking away from the past or something. 
That's how I remember the book anyway. I don't remember a while. But it's, I think I it's, it's the intention. But, I think that but Marty's intention is not to do that. Marty doesn't have yeah. an agonistic yeah. intention towards his forebears. Yeah. As I also think is. that the influence can be contextualized or like historically placed either in the 70s today and then in the 19th century. And I'm not a 19th century scholar either. Yeah. But I think emulation, um, influence, and straight up what we would call plagiarism was actually operated differently. Then, that like yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah, more commonplace or right. just like think right. that that was something that happened as a way of what we might see today as kind of like riffing off another person's idea, um, but as something. More, but again, like I'm not a scholar from the time period, so I don't know. Like, how, like I can't really point. It's just a good impression I get that in the 19th century there was a different relationship. With it. And, yeah. If I can just add something, I think your point is extremely interesting, and I think if you look at it in terms of the entirety of Marti's experience, Marti is engaged in a real and actual struggle against the father. He's literally making war on his fatherland, right? So, and talk about anxiety of influence, he is a Spaniard, he is of Spanish parents, and he is leading a war against Spain, and that's what his whole life is leading to. So given that that is the central thrust of his life, you can see how in his literary life, he would seek something different, a respite from that. He doesn't want to make war in his literary life. He wants to embrace and you know, carry forward and perpetuate. So um, that might be one way of explaining you know, his departure from that paradigm. I was, I was also thinking that that's very interesting because I think both Martí and Darío, they were trying to create modernity. They were very aware of their, their position uh, regarding modernity and regarding uh, the condition of their countries. And one of the things that modernism in Spanish America and Latin America, uh, the way I read it, is that uh, these writers, they wanted to create a tradition linked to modernity. And for them, in a very conflictive way, the U.S. was modernity. So embracing Whitman and embracing the U.S. in this way was also a reflection of modernity. So that's why you see this, you know, this lineage because it was a way of embracing modernity for them. So what you said, it's, it's really, really interesting. And it made me think about this idea of how they wanted to be at the same level. They wanted to embrace this tradition of modernity. Mm -hmm. So that might be why they, they are reading Whitman and the US in this conflictive way. Right? They are embracing and at the same time they, they are very aware of you know uh, the, the, the relationship to this new modernity. So that's something that it's you know uh, that's that's how I'm reading it. That's really interesting, and I would also add that I think that with Whitman, the, the, the anxiety of influence is always against somebody in your same language, in your same national tradition, where you're struggling against them to achieve that ascendance within the national tradition. It's never, I don't think it's ever directed towards people outside of your national tradition. Because he does so, critique romanticism. Well, Darío is the old poetry. So they're selecting and inventing a specific past so they can invent a future, right? Yes. Right. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, Whitman's new for them. Whitman is the new thing. It's yeah. not so much the old yeah. thing. Yeah. Even though Whitman's an old, an old guy, yeah. Whitman's new. Yeah. We've got one more slide. Sure. I have one more comment on translation. Just to we're going to see this in the handout this afternoon by Christo America. Context. And translation. So you have the translation, Esther's wonderful translation of Whitman and Isaiah, and there's a, a very good one by Louis Baron also. And this is one, not to criticize this person, but the light, because the handout that had the two poems, the, the, the Walt Whitman uh, by Daria and the translation, also had the last lines of this translation of the, um, of the of Marti's essay on Whitman. And the last lines are from Whitman, okay? So what you do is you take the Whitman lines from him, and that's what Esther did, and that's what Louis Farrell did. Disembody, that's the word. Disembody, talking about death at the end. So disembody triumphant death. And Carefree just doesn't really want to there. 
So just to let you know, it's just one of the countless examples where the context matters. Now, we're going to look just very quickly um, at uh, some people who were influenced by Whitman. And then I want to suggest again the difference between the two newspapers to which Marti sent these files. OK. Women's impact in Latin America. Just, I didn't mention Pedro Mir of the Dominican Republic. There are many more. Just to give you some big names, women's impact in Latin America, thanks to Marti and Darío. In the two cases, Octavio Paz and Pablo Neruda, these are, are poets uh, with, you know, uh, robust uh, free lines, uh, very much uh, following in some of the ways that Whitman expressed that. Now, Jorge, well, Jorge, you have to think, like, what does his poetry have to do with Whitman? And of course, with Borges, it's philosophical, right? But what he does is, is write about Whitman making the reader part of the poetry. So you don't, you don't see it in the work of Borges, you see it in the comments that Borges makes about Whitman. Now the last thing I want to mention, so we'll end on time, is a question, two different newspapers, two different times, but also two different newspapers. And I think that has a lot to do with um, the impact of these writers and how they reached a bigger public. As we've seen, Emerson, there was a, I mean, eventually the, the um, article in Developing the National from Caracas did trickle out, right? But it, it can't be said to be a big way that, that Emerson became to be, came to be known to Spanish America. Now, in the case of Marti and Whitman, of course there's this really important example of the poem that Daddy wrote, but remembering Argentine roots. Okay, La Nación was a big, important newspaper. I'm going to thank my colleague, Ariela Schneermeyer, in her wonderful new book, in pointing out that La Nación, founded by uh, Bartolome Mitre in 1870, after his term as president of Argentina, was a more independent paper, as Ariela says, not beholden to some of the commercial and censorship interests. So, I mean, he, the editor, Mitre, did try to tone down some of what Marti said. But this was a paper with a bigger <coughs> kind of impact. So just the fact that the Whitman essay went to this important Argentine newspaper, and the Emerson one went to a less important newspaper um, in, in Venezuela, in, in Latin America, is it has to do with the spread of information about these two American authors. So if we have any questions, we're going to kind of connect to some of these things.